So welcome everyone to our first historic Food history district meeting since 2020 in what February I think was the last time that we all got together so this is really exciting and thank you to everyone who is here and then as you may notice we are recording this meeting just the presenters you will all be on camera um, we had a couple people email saying that they couldn't make it this morning or that they weren't comfortable coming back yet so we will have this available digitally after and I will send that out so we have a lot to talk about today, so let's just get into it. First of all, I'm Haley Manhattan, and I'm the Community Relations Coordinator for the Ogden Downtown Alliance. So you've probably received a lot of emails from me, or I've stopped into your business recently to give you a bunch of information. So if you haven't met me yet, nice to meet you. And then I wanted to take a second just to introduce Thomas Kiernan, who is our new Digital Marketing Coordinator. He joined during the pandemic, and so if you haven't seen him yet, now you know, and so he also does a lot with social in our website, so you'll probably see him out and about either with me or by himself taking photos. And then Jessica Boyer is the new 25th Street liaison from Boyer Wealth Management. She is unable to be here this morning, but she was looking forward to meeting you all. So her business cards are on the front table if you want to connect with her. And just as a reminder, our liaisons sit on our ODA Board of Directors for one year, and they serve as a point of contact for you on the streets. So you can either ask her questions or myself and definitely stop in and see her. You might see her walking around as well. So just added support there. And then I wanted to take a minute, since this is our first time all back together, and just do quick introductions. So if you'll just say your name and then what business or organization you're from, that would be great. And let's just start here with Andy. Hi everyone, my name's Andy Neff. I'm the uh, Public Relations Manager for the Ogden BRT Project. I'm Bill Knowles, and I'm Business Community Liaison uh, for UTA on the BRT Project. I'm Brian Chamberlain, here to talk about the 24th Street Reconstruction Project, Viaduct. Alex wants an initial about the Tristan Viaduct. Subject. <laughs> Robert Stark with Queen Bee. Lee Bee with Pepper. Robbie um, Nate with uh, Ingbat Arsdale with Robert Sessions. I'm Thomas, I'll move down my eyes. I think we're trying to make this through and So. Michael, what happened to you? Not quite. Yeah, I crashed on my own. I can work fast, I started. Michael, not like enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> I work here. <laughs> I'm Kim Bachman, the director here at the Downtown Alliance. Uh, Darren Blackford, owner of Lost Outdoors and Company. I'm Brandon Cooper, uh, obviously. Wow, oh, grace by Brandon. <laughs> so the, this will go a little out of order. We're actually going to start with the BRT project, and then we'll move into Make Ogden, and then the 24th Street Viaduct project. So take it away, Emmy. Thanks, Haley. Okay, um, so my role in the project, I, I actually um, you know, work with uh, Stacy and Whitbeck Construction Company. They're the contractor that UTA uh, selected to build the project. And so I'm the one that's responsible for the day-to-day -day boots on the ground um, outreach. So working with the businesses that are affected along the route, the businesses, the residents, and also mass communication, uh, Facebook, um, email updates, website, all that is, is kind of within my realm on this project. But uh, Bill and I are very excited to be here today. This is a great opportunity. We uh, appreciate you coming out today. Uh, we want to share a little bit of background on the Ogden BRT. You're um, being on 25th Street, you're not directly affected by the construction of this project. Um, so that's a good thing, but uh, we wanna make you aware of what's happening kind of in the area. You've probably driven along Washington Boulevard and some of the areas around town that will be affected over the next two and a half years by construction. So this project has been kind of in the works for uh, about 20 years uh, when Ogden City started looking at uh, transit options in the area. They first of all looked at a gondola. Um, that didn't turn out to be feasible. They have gone through a series of uh, alternatives analyses and environmental assessments, which uh, determined that the uh, bus rapid transit system would be the locally preferred alternative. So they looked at different routes, they looked, looked at different modes, and bus rapid transit ended up being the most uh, cost-effective and feasible option. So, that's been funded now, and we're moving forward with construction. We started on Washington 
um, a couple months ago, and uh, we'll be working. I'll I'll show you first of all. First of all, this is a a partnership between a lot of different agencies. You've got UDOT, you've got UTA, Ogden City, Weber County, you got Weber State University, McKinney Hospital. All these agencies have partnered and been working together for the last 10 plus years to make this project a reality. So the route that was selected, um, you can see, starts at the Ogden Front Runner Station. It's a 5.3 mile fixed guideway route. Uh, BRT is fairly new to Utah. Um, we built one, in, UTA built one, in, uh, called UVX, the Utah Valley Express in Provo and Orem. That finished up a couple years ago and it's been very successful. Has that been very successful? Yeah, they exceeded their ridership goals almost immediately. And that opened two and a half years ago, 15,000 plus, I believe. And that was, one. It, so it's one of the most ridden UTA routes in the whole system, if not the highest. Yeah, it was set for 12,000 and it's done 15,000. Right. And we placed a system that was carrying about 27 or less than 3,000 people. So. Right. So it, um, I think it's going to be the wave of the future. UTA has got projects going all over. I think they've got three or four kind of in the works right now and are studying different areas. There was initially a lot of anxiety in Utah County because it represented something new, a change. But I think people have been able to ride it and see the benefits and see how it helps speed their travel um, through the project area. So we're very optimistic we're going to have the same results here in Ogden City. So there are 13 stations along that 5.3 mile long route. You can see comes uh, down 23rd Street, past the Junction, down Washington, past the Egyptian Theater and Active Center, and then east on Washington, or east on 25th Street, over to Harrison Boulevard, down Harrison, through the Weber State Campus, and terminates at the um, KD Hospital. So on this map, you can see um, the blue represents uh, shared use lanes. So these are areas where the bus travels with regular traffic. And then uh, the red is uh, dedicated bus lanes. That's one of the trademarks of the bus rapid transit system is uh, bus loading lanes. So once it gets over to Harrison at 32nd Street, all the way down south through the Weber State Campus, we'll be uh, that we're building, we're widening the road to put dedicated lanes in the center, and you'll see center running stations. If you've been on UBX and Provo, it will be very, very similar to what, what that is. Meaning the station is on the east side of the road? Is that what you're saying by center? So on Harrison, they're actually in the center. <coughs> it's center. In the middle of the road. Really? Yep. On the other side of the lanes of traffic, the far lanes of traffic? Like where are the turn lanes sure. traditionally? Yeah, see, I'll you probably at well, we intersections and there's crosswalks there, but right. it's in the middle, so you get off and walk you that way or that way. Oh, okay. This is an signalized of Harrison. You probably can't see this very well, but that that's that's 36th Street and 32nd Street, so you can see the stations are right right in the center. So you're gonna so the lanes you're building out are the cars. The ones the roads that you've got closed off the construction you're doing. Does that make sense? I guess you have to do both to put the station and build the extra lane. Um, on Harrison, so the part that's done right now visibly is on Washington, right. and that creates added lane space. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, that creates the platform spaces for those ones. And then Harrison starts construction today, right? Yeah, they're doing some preliminary utility work this starting this and, week, and that would be the opposite. So, like, I'm just, I'm just yeah. is that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know. No, you're good. <laughs> I'll show you, uh, give you, uh, kind of show you the different areas here in the schedules. But uh, anyway, so that that's an overview of the project. We, we started construction about six weeks ago. Uh, we're plan, planning to open in the fall of 2023. Um, the goal is to get that operational um, by August time frame before Weber State um, starts up in the fall of 2023. Uh, some other features of bus rapid, rapid transit, um, again, so UTA likes to call BRT tracks on rubber tires. It operates 
it, it'll feel really like a track, like the tracks if you've ridden that, but in a bus instead of on a rail. So with the dedicated bus lanes, we have a, a mile and a half of that on Harrison and through Beaver State. Uh, we'll have 11 clean air, all electric buses. Uh, their buses are about 40 feet long, carry about uh, 36, there are 36 seats plus standing room, so that gives you an idea of the capacity. Um, there are 19 lights where we'll have signal priority, so there's technology on the buses that communicates with the traffic signals to give them priority um, to extend green time. So for instance, if they're behind schedule, they can extend the green time, and that really adds to the reliability of the overall system helps it move through signals and, and keep on, uh, on time. And so it'll operate about every 10 to 15 minutes on weekdays, we'll be able to catch bus at, at these 13 stations and every 15 to 30 minutes on the weekends. And then UTA, UTA recently received a federal grant to offer free fare for the first three years. So that should help get people, attract a lot of riders initially to get people to use the system and see how it works and see the benefits that will come from it. So the stations will be uh, modern. So this is Washington Boulevard. We were talking about that a second ago. Washington, actually between 24th and 25th Street is where we're working right now. And so for the southbound BRT route, the station will be in the center of, of Washington, right across from the Egyptian uh, theater there. And then for the northbound route, it'll be it'll be a side running station right by the farm utility. So most of the stations on this project are side running, but again, uh, Washington and then Harrison also have the kind of center running. There's a, a rendering of the Browning Center station up on campus. So these stations will have raised platforms. The buses will be low floor to speed the the um, boarding on and off. Uh, there will be there will be prepaid ticketing in, for in the future. It will be free for the first three years. But these will be very modern looking stations. Um, they're uh, working. Bill's working on a committee right now with, with the city and some others to come up with some art. Um, to they're looking at some laminated glass designs. Yeah, you might point out that between those pillars, there's glass windscreens. That for the artwork. And then there's a rendering of the, uh, the McKinney Hospital. So, yeah, the design right now is it's starting to look exactly like that, but this is just an artist's rendering of what those stations will look like. There's a picture of the electric bus. Um, again, there'll be 11 of those. So, all 11 will be on that 5.3 mile route at any given time and hold uh, you know, about 40 people. Okay, I know you're not probably super interested in, in construction outside of 25th Street, but there's some pictures of showing what we're doing in Washington. We're um, reconstructing just the area between 24th and 25th Street where the stations will go. Between 23rd and 24th, there's some very minor signal work, so we're not going to affect that area much. But we hit a milestone last week. We um, have reconstructed the northbound lane, we got that paved back. We have traffic switched. To the north, to the east side of the street, and we're reconstructing the southbound lanes, and we expect that to continue through about early June, and then we'll shift traffic to the outside, and then reconstruct the center. And you'll see station uh, platform work going on through this fall on Washington. We're maintaining business access. You can see we have walkways that are, are maintained, and we're working very closely with the businesses to try to minimize impact as much as possible. And then up on Weaver State, we are in the process of building some retaining walls and we just started some of the removals for the, the Browning Center Station and that will continue through, through this fall. Construction schedule. So this is probably too small for you to read as well, but just a general snapshot. We plan to be on finish up Washington, the major roadway work by July 24th. And uh, U UDOT's got a paving project that will come through on Washington after that, so we're, we're on a very tight schedule to finish that. There will be station work that we'll do 
continue through this fall, but that shouldn't affect traffic. So once we wrap that up, uh, late July, we'll move over to the Intermodal Center, front of our station, we'll work there through this fall, and then this fall, we'll move over to 25th Street. So right now, the city's doing a water line um, replacement project on 25th Street, and that's kind of a precursor to our, our project that will start in the fall, and we'll come and, and uh, this fall through the following spring work on 25th Street. And then Harrison Boulevard is where uh, most of the work is happening on this project. Since we're, we're widening to put those dedicated bus lanes in the center, it's pretty complicated. And there's a lot of work that will continue all the way through uh, summer of 2023. But we are doing it in phases to keep uh, traffic moving in both directions. And uh, we're very cognizant that the business, there, there are a lot of businesses along that route. And, and so we're, Bill and I are, are working very closely with them to understand how we can minimize impacts for them. Any questions on schedule? <clears throat> will they be open on, will they run on Sundays? And how late will they be open on Friday, Saturday? We will run Sundays. I running Sundays, the, the hours, the late hours for the weekend is still, I think, a matter of discussion. But they've expanded them down in Provo and in Salt Lake as demand has increased. Um, so I they haven't got that definitely set yet. But I think it'll go that direction, frankly, from what we've seen in the past. So, um, how late are they running down there right now? Till midnight. Till midnight. Yeah, and they run the tracks train and, and tracks the trains themselves. Uh, so the UBS is running till midnight. Uh, trains just got there since so they have to share places, they have to share tracks with the UP freight trains down there, so that had to get worked through. So, but downtown, they're, they're open to that, and uh, it's the same that popular demand. So, I, I think we'll see a similar direction here, but it's not decided yet. So, I think it'll kind of depend on how the demand is and it starts to go up like it's been in other. Well, how about uh, what time will, will they open? So, what times do they start in the morning down in Provo? I what, how soon in the morning? Yeah, uh, I think they're starting at six a.m. Okay. Good questions. Yeah. Will that construction close Twenty Fifth Street? Start we will. Yeah, we'll have to do. Um, temporary closures on 25th Street. East of Washington. East, east of Washington. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this All is all Washington, Washington to Harris. Yeah. Okay, and then 23rd Street, that is, that'll be closest to you, but that's kind of one of the last items on our schedule uh, to do between Wall Avenue and Washington on 23rd Street past the junction. That'll be late fall 2022 through the spring. So uh, my role on the project is to educate the community about BRT, how it works, how it can improve your life. And so, and also give work, work with businesses and residents to give them construction information. So we have a lot of different resources that we're utilizing to do that. We, uh, Bill and I frequently do door to door visits um, to businesses to check in and see how things are going and uh, what we can do to help promote them during construction and keep them viable. Um, we have fact sheets, door hangers, construction flyers, we have retail counter cards. I left those, some of those out here on the front <coughs> desk. If you would like to have those for your business, let me know. Um, there's just a limited number there, but if you need more, it's just kind of a, a little postcard that you can put on your front desk for customers if they have questions about what's going on or what, what's BRT. Um, there are links on there to our Facebook page and our website, and also they can reach out to me if they have any questions via email or, or phone. And then community events, we have a traveling display that will be taken, taken around to like the farmer's market. We'll be starting um, next week, actually. I think next weekend is the first week for farmer's market. We'll have an information booth there. And then you'll see us around the community, the different fairs and festivals. <coughs> I think there's a, a car show on 25th Street coming up. We plan to participate in that. So we really want to get the word out. And so people know what's going on and, and 
also to educate them about what BRT is so they want to ride right when they open up in the fall of 2023. We have weekly uh, e-newsletters. If you want to sign up for those, you can go to our website and sign up there. Our Facebook page also is a really good source of information. Those are some of the community events that we'll be a part of this summer. And then Facebook is also is a way that we are using to promote businesses. Bill, do you want to take a minute to talk about that? Yeah, we, we uh, started on the UVX project doing, uh, taking it up a notch, if you will, in some of our past projects, uh, promoting businesses uh, in print in different ways, and uh, started doing uh, live video uh, meetings and interviews with the businesses and it really caught on. So we would go into individual local businesses, talk to them about their history, what they do, meet the owners, that kind of stuff, and, and post it on YouTube and Facebook. And, uh, and a lot of times they would have special deals going on. Here might have been Mother's Day or it might have been the 4th of July, whatever. And they would be having something relative to those events that we would promote in that discussion. And it really caught on. We, we got so many hits on that. Uh, it, uh, it became a part of our, our regular repertoire now. And uh, we are doing some uh, downtown right now. We've had three events. Uh, we've got another one scheduled for next week at the, at the missionary store. Uh, we've, we've done Fars Jewelry. We've done the Recreation Outlet, um, Olive and, and Dahlia. And, and so it's really, it's, it's a fun deal because uh, a lot of these people don't get seen or aren't noticed so much in terms of just people driving by down the street and all of a sudden you, you, you pick these people out and they've got some really cool businesses going. So it does help getting people to notice. And we, of course, make a big thing out of saying you can get in, you can get out, uh, there's parking here, you can get there, and, and making sure that people know even though the construction and the orange signs are everywhere, you can get in and out safely and conveniently And these businesses. More than that, they need your help uh, to uh, come here now and not drive the other way. This is a good time to support those businesses. So it, it's been a big part of our uh, efforts. And we are, in fact, um, we established a, uh, which we've done in the past, also we uh, have put money from the project and the city matches those funds to put into a marketing fund uh, to help uh, promote the overall businesses. And sometimes we do individual coupon things as part of that. And uh, we've got a committee mostly made up of business and business community people here that we are just uh, at the first meeting, right? Okay. So we're getting together starting today, later, and uh, we'll have ongoing meetings to talk about different ways to apply those funds in a positive way, drawing people into the businesses along the construction corridor to help people continue to recognize they need to support these businesses and not drive off the other way uh, when they see a construction site. So, um, it, it's kind of an, an effort in shaming the public into making sure that they continue to support these local businesses that we all want and need so bad uh, in terms of the one, when the project's done, we want them all to be here. So um, that's, that's uh, a lot of what we do in, in terms of um, committing to keeping businesses jamming and, and, and keeping them busy during these uh, big projects. And in the end, when they're done, it is good for business. And so that's one thing we've seen consistently. These projects end up being uh, an asset to businesses when they're completed. Getting through that process is, is what we spend a lot of time and, and some considerable money at right now. Um, Bill, for people who want to, they'll have a slide at the end of their presentation that has all their contact information on it. If you want to like photograph that, you can also email our office if you want to sign up with Bill for those um, videos. But one thing, Washington Boulevard, the businesses that you've already interviewed, which is great, um, Washington Boulevard obviously is impacted, but 25th Street, like crossing 
from residential to, to 25th Street in particular is probably the hardest thing to get to downtown. So I really would recommend um, you guys as businesses in that area taking advantage of this offer that they're doing um, and, then, and then sharing that with your neighbors because the more of you and video content is huge on social is like the most um, performing, engaging piece of the puzzle. Um, and it's also expensive, so if they're willing to do that. Um, but the more of us that can be saying how to get and navigate to 25th Street and how um, you can still park, and it's just a little bit funky right now. It absolutely is, you know, we have joked in our office which was supposed to be <laughs> telling people how to get here, and every day it's a little bit different just to come to our office. So because of all those different interconnected projects that are happening, um, but I'd love to see more businesses taking advantage of what these guys are trying to do. Yeah, we're, we'll be working very closely with this group, believe me, and, and, and using their resources as well as city resources and WSU, and, and it is a community effort. I, I get on a big soapbox uh, frequently <laughs> about that um, because it is, in fact, uh, y you know, this is the community. Uh, all of these small businesses, uh, and, and it's not that the larger ones don't need it, they get impacted either. But it's the small businesses that, that have the, the, the less uh, resilience or resistance to it. So we make a real big effort in keeping the community aware of keeping that support going, these guys. And, 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 and downtown in general, so it isn't just because you're out of the project area that you're not you know, possibly impacted because of people determined that coming down here maybe is a cool uh, we, we, we address that. We want to keep all of that going. And so even if you're over here, we want to make sure that you are getting the benefit of, of some of that communication also. So it's, as I say, a community effort. It's not just specifically part on the street there. Right. That's one of our goals is to really integrate into the community with, with our outreach and, and uh, <clears throat> promote businesses and, and keep them healthy during this whole process. Okay, I'll go ahead and wrap up. This this is our contact information. So this is our hotline number, email. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out at any time. And then also, uh, please like our Facebook page. You'll I think you'll find a lot of useful information there. The information about BRT and how it works. We have animations on there showing the bus kind of going in different areas. One that we're still working on, but one we have up on Weaver State campus, and then. The business with bill videos are really, really good, and I, I think will drive a lot of people to help help the business community uh, through the construction process. So, with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Unless we have any further questions or comments from the group. Real quick, um, and you, and you probably touched on this early on, and probably early in the planning process. But what is the old, what was the why is this happening? What is the objective of this project as a whole? And I know you, you laid it out on what it is and how it's happening and when, but I still want to wrap. I mean, it, is it to reduce um, vehicle in the area or is it to, I mean, it, it seems like the right thing to do, but what is the selling point overall on this um, that will help us do with business owners? Um, well, why are you doing this? Yeah, ultimately, mass transit is about that. It is about reducing vehicle traffic and and, and putting more people uh, uh, and, and more and using roadways and guideways more efficiently and carrying a large number of people. And uh, and then there are side benefits to that in terms of designing your build outs of, of city cores and of city, you know, and suburbs, of course, so that you hear a lot about transit oriented development. So nodes start to, to be built around transit stops and, and transit locations in order to more efficiently, when you've got a growing area like this, and we're looking 20 and 30 years in advance. So to the degree that it works today is good, but it's really looking at the future. It's looking at your kids, maybe your grandkids, uh, in terms of where this 
valley and where this area will be built out in 20 and 30 years. And I can tell you that it happens uh, as I've been here that long now. And in Utah County, where I grew up, um, it, it, it quadrupled from the time I moved there in 1958 to when we opened that, that transit line down there. So I can tell you that density is real. And, it's, and of course, we're fortunate, right? We're living in this great place. Everybody wants to not leave or move to. And uh, it's great. But we are faced with the restrictions. We've got that mountain range. We've got that lake. And everything is in between that, right? And so how many more freeways is there room for? Uh, and where do, you know, how many roads you can't build them up? So what you have to do is put more capacity on the road the best way you can. So that comes down to mass transit. And this won't happen anytime immediately or anytime really soon, <clears throat> but in some areas, um, the efficiency of, of a rail takes over from bus. So uh, because <clears throat> when it reaches a certain capacity, you add a rail car or you had another rail car. With a bus, you have to put a whole new bus, a whole new bus driver, and a whole new part of the system in there. So um, in some places in the world, in, in uh, <clears throat> South America and in Canada, another example, BRT is turned into light rail. So I don't think that's gonna happen anytime real soon here. Uh, it was close, by the way, in Provo Orn, in terms of the ridership qualifying for light rail. Um, but there was, there was quite a bit of study, like, honestly, <laughs> I said this too. We, as long as I had worked at 25th Street, Nick and I worked at 25th Street, we have been talking about this project um, <laughs> and this different study. We're, and I've been doing it 10 years, and this is longer than that. So, um, but I remember being at Crawford when it first opened on 25th Street, and that was the final study phase of the route and where it's going to be at. So there's a lot of point to point um, where are they trying to, who needs to be served to move people and to reduce vehicle usage. And they're saying obviously, um, but then why does it come this far versus just being on Harrison? There's a lot of study about that. And then once those things were decided, the thing that culminated at that meeting was um, why the route goes the way it does, because it kind of zigs from um, the transit center up and over. And that was quite honestly due to a lot of business owners on 25th Street um, being against the route coming down that street and some other you know, long term planning concepts for 25th Street, too. So that's why it really almost like avoids that so that it can support that bulking density just to the north and then swing up and go back up. Harrison for or up point this street for Harrison where I went actually. Um, well, but, but I don't know if that helps answer your question. Oh, it does. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Is, it, it seems like reducing traffic congestion and, it's, and has that been captured down the road? It's, you, know, it's, it's you can be calling it part of a city growing up, uh, and, and it really is that. And it's um, as you said, we've been studying, I've been coming up here almost 12 years studying this. I worked on that other one in Provo Orange for over 13 years. Uh, and this is, th this is the end of it, <laughs> the start of it for you when you see the construction. But th this, is, this is now the end of the project. And, um, and so far I can be, and I've been doing this for 20 years, um, from re retiring, had to retiring from my own business. Um, and they work. I gotta tell you, uh, and I had no idea what I was stepping into when I did, totally unrelated to mass transit, but uh, I am, uh, I, I, my little mantra is mass transit is good for business. It is. And so uh, people get in and out easier, don't worry about parking, uh, don't worry about traffic and you know anything you can do. And when you get into densifying uh, an area like this, it works. So it's, it's part of the process of growing, growing up as a, as a city, and uh, you guys are you guys are there. You're you're ready. So yeah, we. Uh, well, that's great. And it seems like it's the right thing to do. And I just wanted to be sure I had it clear. Yeah, we'll uh, 
it's messy getting messy getting through it. Is <laughs> if we can find a you know cleaner, faster way to get it done, I'd sure be in favor of that. But um, it, it's a process we have to go through, and we work hard at keeping folks you know going while while we get this done. So. Well, thank you guys. Okay. Um, these guys have stuff over here, and I'll, I was going to say this later, but I'll say it up in the segue to the brand who's being on the back end um, of the presentation here. Um, and it, it, there's so many layers to everything that is being talked about, and walkability is kind of a big word that we say a lot of the time, and it's more complicated than just like, you know, you should walk around. <laughs> Um, the pieces have to be there to make it a walkable community and feel safe and feel connected. And so transit is definitely part of that. When Brennan is talking about Make Ogden, you'll notice some additional like, mid-block crossings that are planned and called for in that. But another thing, in addition to in addition to like what they're doing with these videos for this specific project to get through all of this, another huge piece of the puzzle is encouraging ridership and awareness of ridership and why would you ride too so we need people who are already using the transit system to pull up on that even before the like population density changes so we have to have a practice in being a walkable community so shifting that kind of narrative we have people right now who don't want to walk from the junctions across to this building like don't want to park that, that's so far away and so when we deal with the parking conversation, when we deal with event planning, that lack of desire to walk even that little bit of distance is something that all of these things help us to address a little bit more. A little bit more. Um, and so with that, I, I don't know if you all are in the Facebook group, but it's a business on just downtown. But I just posted last night, UTA, on another level from these guys, is doing a transit passport to help promote transit ridership even before this project is done. In Weaver County um, specifically, we're working with local first, first Utah um, and UTA to put that passport together. And so they'll be sending that information out to kids and like their backpack drops and, and families are encouraging them to ride during the summer. So if you saw that in the Facebook group, you can sign up and they'll add you to their transit map as a, as a place near a stop. And so they'll actually call that out and the kids can come and get their little transit passport stamped. And it's kind of a switch for that awareness. And so there's a lot of different layers to how they're approaching um, not just the BRT project as a standalone piece, but how is that, how is that a part of what Brennan is working on with New and how, how is that a part of all of these different pieces and bringing it together? Hopefully, we can get this presentation. And, and we got to. Um, you can see those pieces kind of molding together more and more. It's exciting. <laughs> you can keep going. <laughs> that was perfect. Well, thanks to those gentlemen for their good work, and it has been a long, a long process. And I like how you phrased it. That this is the end of it. I've been on the outskirts of it for about twelve or thirteen years. Uh, those guys have been in the trenches. Uh, How long have you been in the city, Brennan? Uh, 14 years. Well, so, I yeah, <laughs> I, I've been blessed to be part of all the major stuff yeah. since the IRS. Yeah, it's been fun. Um, this is a little light, so hopefully you can see that. I probably won't talk about the whole uh, presentation here. I, I wanted to focus a little bit um, on episode one. So if you're familiar with the Make Ogden plan, it's a 20 year plan for the downtown broken up into five, uh, to four um, five year periods, phases, we call them episodes. Uh, episode one focuses on uh, around 25th Street. Essentially what we found out in the 18 month planning process is that the community um, perspective is that really the downtown is 25th Street Union Station area, right? The CBD is, a, is much bigger than that, but everyone's view of the downtown really sits right there um, at 25th Street and the station. So from, from that input, we made a plan that really doubles down on 25th Street and, and grows it from there. So everything we talk about and think about really has um, 
a lot to do with how do we support the industry, how do we plug people into it, how do we enhance it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about three things briefly today. One are, uh, is the Wonder Block uh, project. Um, if that's the old uh, hostess site, if you're not familiar with that. The 100 block on the north side of 25th Street, um, that's going to be interesting really fast. And then parking in general. Um, so this is a map kind of of the first episode. Here is the 100 block project. Um, here's the here's the 100 block project. So it's a massive project. Uh, right now we're still in our um, pre-development planning phase. Uh, we did get um, general site development design approval by the planning commission. So essentially the, the project is a new hotel, which is going to live on 25th Street, actually, right there, in the empty lot. Kim's going to be excited about that. Right there, let me see. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll have an office building, a grocery store, apartments, um, 67,000 square feet of new retail uh, and commercial space. The office building is about 100,000 square feet-ish. Um, we'll have 1,200 parking stalls, which I'll kind of get into in just a minute. Um, and over uh, not quite 300 residential units, mostly apartments that will be some townhomes. Um, and the really cool thing is the linkage between 25th Street uh, through the site and and you know east west to the amphitheater, um, and then down to 26th Street. So we really wanted to make we have large blocks in Ogden and in general in Utah, and so. A lot of our planning efforts are to break those blocks down into small chunks to allow for uh, people walking around. It's hard to go 660 feet in a square, um, but if you can break that down into small chunks, then that really helps. And if then you can make uh, walking through those smaller chunks something that's enjoyable. Um, take, for instance, Kiesel Avenue. Kiesel is highly trafficked, um, believe it or not, but it's a terrible street for a lot of reasons. Um, but it's really one of the major, or could be a major linkage between the junction and 25th Street and the amphitheater, especially. Um, so we would like to enhance this so that we bring more people walking across this area and then make it that much more enjoyable for them to do that, safe, um, interesting, those kind of things. So that's kind of the concept behind that block. Um, the, uh, so that's, that's going now. And we probably won't see physical construction until the first quarter of next year. The first thing out of the ground will be a new parking structure. The way that works is that um, there's a parking structure hidden in here, and there's another parking structure hidden, hidden in there. And in order to accommodate the state courts, which is giving us some of the land that, that they have now to accommodate all this, we have to build a parking structure first to put them into it, and then we'll build a residential around. Uh, so that'll start happening hopefully end of this year, probably the first quarter of the year. That's a long time coming. We're working with them. Yeah. Yeah. We bought that in 2016 and then tore it down in 18 and yeah. have been planning ever since. It takes a long time. It's about a $200 million project. So it will be the biggest thing that Ogden has seen other than the BRT um, since the junction. The junction well, didn't even cost this much. Um, Can you tell them where the that red line with the arrow is in the RT route? Yep. This guy here? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we'll come up 25th Street. Um, part of what Make Ogden did is it balanced the public investment and the private investment. And so it called out areas where the public needs to invest, meaning the city and, and, and county governments. 25th Street is primarily one of the um, major points of public investment. So we have in our CIP plan, our capital improvement plan, a process to allow us to fund enhancements to 25th Street. Uh, we haven't designed that yet. We hope to do that with you all um, because that's your, your front yard and backyard. But to me, that looks like um, sidewalk enhancements, roadway enhancements, uh, landscaping. One of the critical parts of this for all of you who are on the south side of 25th Street, especially um, as you abut the um, Wonder Block, is that traditionally the back of your building has been kind of the back house. That's where your electrical transformer is, that's where your trash cans are. Right now, this plan hopes to 
um, enhance that. So now you have two sides of your business and the backside now runs into a multi hundred million dollar project. Um, and so we're trying to support Kim uh, in the facade improvement program. We've got some ideas that we need to talk about. Um, maybe with some of this um, America recovery money, we can use that to enhance some of that um, for the back side of businesses along 25th Street on both sides. And we actually, that facade improvement grant is actually written in such a way to support this plan with that back of health service. So it is a facade improvement, but then when you read the beginning, it says that you have um, public use of back of house, and then you're eligible for that too. So places like, um, like and Jelly Jar, they have both sides right now, but not everyone has that, but besides, like it changes that alleged and, and what besides and then even over to like social acts and things like that, all being that interconnected visible piece to the, that red line that connects to 25th Street is pretty significant, even though it's tiny, that's a big deal in the planning process of everything. Actually, I'll tell you this too. You the mid block line? Yes. Yeah. This yeah. Here? Um, yeah. This is totally off the cuff, I'm sorry. Um, but we had a group, we're partnering with Parents of Curia and Mind to do this Kids Academy. And we were talking about how art can help kind of highlight some of the spaces that we're talking about. And we told a story about starting Beats and Beats was in the team throughout the year. The city bought it. And then um, we had a couple hundred people come out there. And we were under the gas pump, the old gas pump. It was kind of a cool aesthetic. But yeah. so many people came there and they're like, I come downtown all the time. And this is a place I haven't even thought of. We just drive by vacant spaces and so long that they become invisible to you. And so being able to bring them back into the conversation and having people see there is opportunity and this could be something. Um, now we're in that, this is going to be something. But there's so many other properties that are called for in this new housing plan, filling those like vacant pieces. I think that's what you'll see a lot of from our office is, is kind of programming pop-up programs and events that can help bring awareness and visibility to that as part of their um, public properties plan. So, when you see those things, they're not just like little events because we feel like doing something small and silly. It's because there's there's a thought process and the strategy of bringing people in and on board with the conversations that are happening more big picture. Yeah, we have a lot of really cool nodes in the downtown, you know, Union Station, downtown 25th Street, whatever. But the connection of all of those is really what Make Ogden is about. I just uh was curious, what's the time frame for like episode three to the time we get to episode four projected? Uh, 20, so they're five year episodes. So we're in episode one now. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope to see everything that we have kind of envisioned in episode one done by 2025. Mm -hmm. um, and then in episode two would kick in. And it's not a science, right? I mean, it's opportunistic, um, it's also deliberate. So as much as we can balance those things together, we'll continue to march on. The idea is, is that the plan sets out principles and those principles are applied to projects and to strategies and programs. And to the extent that they all mesh together, uh, we'll try to balance that. But it's a 20 year plan. Okay. Um, if you've been to the great places of the world, I mean, you know that part of that experience is um, discovery, right? Walking down a street and turning and boom. One of the coolest experiences I've ever had with my family is struggling up the um, arches climb, right? My family's not super athletic. Um, and, uh, you know, we struggled and then boom, you come around that corner and the payoff is amazing. And so we have the, the potential for that here. We're, we've traditionally been scared of narrow alleys and and corridors and things because the boogeyman hides in those. Um, but there are, and we don't necessarily want to do that, but there are linear connections and there are street um, scapes and, and cool things we can do to connect all of the wonderful assets that we have. So that's part of this. Um, going back to the kind of facade thing back in the house, uh, on the 100 block on the north side, that's going to be really important as well because um, that project is actually taking place as we speak also. So that's right here. And for the most part, we'll see, 
what will look to everybody as just a traditional apartment building. Um, it's the common living thing. If you have heard of that, it's been in the newspaper a couple of times. Common living is a national group that manages um, uh, shared spaces. So think of the dormitory that you might have been at in college where you have a very small kind of domicile and you share stuff um, as little as uh, a living room. It could be the living room and the kitchen. It could be the living room, kitchen, and bathroom. I mean, it's, it's just kind of a model that um, has worked in highly dense urban areas that they would like to uh, apply to kind of the mid-market, mid-tier cities like Ogden would be. Um, so we're, we're going through that exercise now to figure out what that project looks like. Uh, the common is on board, uh, the powder development guys who did powder mountain, um, they're on board, and a group out of Washington called Outlier Capital, they're on board. And um, that will bring probably 150 or so units, and they should be um, on the lower end of the price scale because of their size, right? Um, they'll still be they'll still be on a per square foot basis, probably uh, expensive, but you know a 600, three to 600 square foot unit for 750, 800, 900 dollars is kind of what yeah. with shared amenities, and it's not for everybody. It's for those people who live their lives outside of their their place of residence, mm -hmm. and so they just want a place to put their head at night, and then boom, they get up and, and go do awesome stuff. Um, so that's happening as we speak, and its front door will face the back of those 25th Street businesses. So having the back of the house now become um, part of your total operation is a consideration we would like to help facilitate. And so will our deliveries be able to, how are we our deliveries? Um, so we, this is how we've envisioned it. This obviously isn't anything but conceptual, but let me see if I can make that bigger. Is that better? Yeah. Um, so here's 25th Street, right? Um, here's kind of what some apartments could look like here. And then we would retain a little bit of the parking because we know that's important. Um, to people. There will be a parking structure just on the back side of this that you'll be able to come down and park into and then get out and walk. But the idea is that we maintain this as a vehicular um, lane and that deliveries are, are set in designated zones, maybe at designated times. So like times. front door, like, like, like I'm, I'm, I'll just be, you know, selfish here. <laughs> so, 25th Street is where the lights are, right? No. no. Oh, this, right. Is, this is 25th Street. This so, is the back of 25th Street. The back on the north side. Block. Block. It's a parking lot right now. That's D&B. Yeah. 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 To 25th Street from the lighted space to 25th Street. So it's not just wall to, to lay them. Yeah. It'll be a mid, it'll be a mid right. Yeah. Right. So there's, an, that they can yeah, there's an empty um, lot there now. Huh. And a building has been approved to go there. Yeah. Um, my friends will know when I move to the other side of the street, I'm going to stop What is the person trash? Deliveries. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Through the back so the like front. when we do that facade thing, mm -hmm. would we? I mean, I'm really so serious about this because we get a lot of deliveries. Yeah. And right now, you know, we have the, where the hotel will be is where they pull in. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes during the farmers market, they pull in the back. But so, what what will that look like? Would it be the front door? I mean, well, I think we understand that operating a business with two doors, two front doors, is really difficult. Right, because it's hard to manage uh, from a point of sale kind of thing. Um, but could a truck come down that highway yes. behind? Yes. So on your side of the street, um, that road that's back. currently owned entirely by the state. Yeah. That was part of one of our very first objectives was to secure that in, into our control, so that we can make sure that at least two thirds of that way, um, we, we won't own all of it from grant or anything, but we'll own two thirds of it. And we'll be able to build in deliveries and all kinds of stuff. Okay, so they would still, wherever they would land, they'd be in the back. Yes. Okay. And if we reconfigure 25th Street, um, 
maybe grow some of that sidewalk area and reduce travel lanes, take out some parking because now we have massive parking structures on the other side. Uh, maybe there's some little green lanes that are being dedicated there as well. We have an early adoption of that. But I wish there was some pretty big stuff for patio and our building. And before we really do it, we try to really get it through and see in the next 10 years what that looks like behind us. Yeah, so we'll, we'll want to kick off some um, really intimate, localized uh, meetings with you all as business owners, the designers for both uh, the water block and this side. Um, and then when we get to 25th Street, uh, redesign that whole thing too. We, it's intended to do this together. Well, it could be a ship. I mean, just I'm in the 200 block, so I don't have that issue because we have the fire line, and that's where they are going for guys' park. So we're, we're and that'll change eventually too. Well, we, it's, I don't know how long we've got to know because, I mean, it's if there's parking there, where they go, what do they do? Right. You know, in one day, they don't have the goods. Yep. So, well, that's why right. this plan from the shop yeah. does answer outlines. Okay. That's fine. Just, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a just in, in your, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. For us Deliveries, um, dumpsters right now, mm -hmm. the dumpster situation on the 200 block has always yeah. been terrible. Right? Yeah. Um, I rebuilt those after they got smashed for 12 years. Um, they're probably need to be rebuilt again. Um, how do you uh, park once and move up and down the street? That's really the goal, right? We can't continue, and this is kind of a segue into the parking. Okay. So we can't continue just to have these giant massive parking lots everywhere. People are gonna have to um, change their behavior when it comes to learning how to park in a parking structure and then utilize um, other forms of transportation if they need to go uh, within a uh, half mile well, you know, uh, radius. Uh, so we're really trying to eliminate the surface parking lots as much as possible, consolidate structured parking where we can park massive amounts of people in a really convenient way and put those in places that make a lot of sense. The Wonder Block will have public parking so you can park there, access 25th Street very easily. Um, this site will have public parking, it'll have parking for the new construction, but it will also have public stalls that the general public can come and pay for and use. Um, we will be removing surface stalls, obviously. Those will be replaced one for one, maybe two for one in the public parking structure. So, Ogden doesn't necessarily have the quantity parking structure problem, right? We have more stalls than we need um, for the business uses. They're just not convenient, they're not in the right places, they're um, not maintained very well. So the whole parking concept is to consolidate those things um, and make them easy and safe. However, to do that, it will then transition the entire downtown area to paid parking. So every street stall, that includes 25th Street, um, street parking, every structured stall, that's including the junction, and American Can, and any new structure that we build, um, those will all be now uh, paid in the downtown. So there won't be any free parking unless you have that associated with your own private property. Um, sorry, I was just going to say the one of the things I like about this plan is that it doesn't have those solutions spelled out and just hand it over to you as a business owner to like deal with. It calls for them coordinating with the business owners to resolve it collectively. Yeah, we've well, developed some concepts, huge. but the functional implementation really needs your input because we don't know we don't know the details, right? We don't know when deliveries happen in general. We don't know what kind of deliveries are the box van. Are they fifty-three footer? You know, are they just little cars? Um, we don't know those things. So we intend to get into the weeds with you all and really work this out. Will that be through this type of avenue? Uh -huh. Yep, yeah. so we'll work with Cam and her group, and okay. um, she'll be kind of the, the coordinator of it all, I hope, and um, and then we'll just like have a charrette, basically. We'll have people that can color the crayons, and we'll get, get a big map, and we'll just doodle on it for hours until we come up with something that's cool and affordable. Are the parking structures, like our bowl books are included in episode one, the ones that you just uh -huh. referenced? So the paid parking will probably be in effect the end of episode one? No, I, my assumption, this is just my guess based on how this is kind of laying out, is I think um, the very first parking structure will be built in Wonderblock, probably complete next year, end of next year. 
we start maybe in January and finish in fall-ish. Once that structure is built and we are charging people to come be parts of it, then all the surface street parking has to convert and pay at the same time. Mm -hmm. So my hunch is by the end of next year, the whole downtown street parking will be paid. And then we'll have the junction and the wonder block structure as the two structures that are paid. And then everything after that will just be paid as well. Which uh, location will that first parking structure be at? It'll be in the Wonder Block property. Um, uh, this guy right here. Where you go? Right here. So there's actually 1,200 stalls on the Wonder Block, and then on the 100 block of 25th Street, um, it could be about somewhere around 600 stalls. So it'll be massive amount of parking that we currently don't have. It'll be more than once here now. And is that separate from like the residents that will be living? You mentioned all of the townhomes or apartments and stuff. Or that's is that their parking? That's inclusive of that. Um, so okay. public stalls will probably have uh, 200 on the Wonder Block, 200 public okay. stalls, and then 150 on the Wonder Block. Mm -hmm. And then there's another there's another parking garage meant to go here, um, right here in this thing, uh, which will be public as well. That's this. Where's that at? Right here. Oh, right here. Finally. We're gonna tear this building down. No, I'm just <laughs> we did want to tear some of those buildings down, but uh, we can't. Well, someone made one. There's right too there. many. There's too many cool things over there. <laughs> So that's um, kind of high level general. Um, I'm glad that uh, we can have that conversation because it's, we really do hope that you engage and it sounds like you will when we start to talk about the actual design of everything and how it's gonna work. So in all of our emails, um, you get from us, like, hey, we speak things, and the emails. Um, at the bottom of every one of those emails is the mayor's uh, presentation of when this plan was adopted, so you can watch the video version. Or you can click through to the PDF, which I printed large because I'm, I, I like the big screens apparently. Um, but all of this is available. You just even just Google and like log in, you can find it. But it's also linked in every one of the emails that we send to you, so you have an update there all the time. Um, and then, like Brandon said, um, we'll absolutely let you know when we're ready to do those um, dialogues conversations. And it is like I know it's a lot of information all the time, it's more than needs to go to, but having your voice is there is going to be and appreciate all of that time that you guys give to these kind of processes that you put in. Well, and I just have to say it because I'm a lazy person in this. <laughs> like, I cannot believe how far we have come. And having and us all fighting together to get Oda off the ground, you know, Brian and Spain and Weighing the fight and taking a leadership role, everything that everybody does in their business. I mean, this is unbelievable. And it's like all the great seats are on the bus right now, you know? And pretty exciting. Things are changing yeah. dramatically. Um, some people don't like it. Um, I mean, it's hard, it's all hard, but it's all good. And yeah. we can live to make it happen, you know? Yeah. It just takes everybody, it's just amazing, you know? We have some things that no one else has, and I think we know that. Um, for, from our perspective, from an administrative perspective, it's time to level up on that um, and double down on the assets that we have. We know exactly what those are and how to do it. It's just now a collective effort to get it done. Um, so we appreciate everybody's input. There's gonna be, um, everybody has thick skin on my side, so uh, if there are concerns or questions, um, there's no wrong, um, there's no bad question or wrong concern. So let's just get it out and, and work on it um, because it will be rapid. Uh, essentially by the end of next year, things will be totally different from a parking and development standpoint. So I do have one more question. So in the short term, whenever that is, just so we look like a spruced up street, like are we all, you know, there's, there's a lot of sad parts and just, you know, the landscape and the good. And stuff or not. Do we just keep going for our own cleanup efforts, planting efforts? So on May 20th, Michael has a link. On May 20th, I don't want to be planning on the street. 
Two trousers. Yeah, it's because you have Wi-Fi in there. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, mean, just, I really don't have to get in the weeds here, but I mean, I think just all of us who are business owners here, you know, we're still that, and we all are. Just well, yeah, here. and I think I think this is a huge point because everyone's like, yes, this is this is coming. When you look at that rendering of Twenty Fifth Street backlit on the second side, and you're like, this is great, and and that is like. A nice vision, but in the meantime, the street does have to be taken care of, and you can't just say, "Oh, well, change is coming." There's a lot that needs to happen constantly down there in those three blocks. And like the city, I think lot this this last year we said after COVID, you know, we thought, or again, as long as um, that BRT conversation, I've been a part of you all fighting to have your street lit where you are decently. And this year we said just just keep the lights on for these species and it doesn't seem like that hard to just keep them on and they did that and they actually rewired um, five or six trees and we had wood here to make that work um, and so I think those conversations are getting that's a stupid conversation to keep having an argument over and I think those conversations are getting a lot easier to have because of a plan like this because you say that's this awesome is, yeah this is what you're this is what you're calling out, so now like, let's do it. And it just makes it a lot easier for people to say yes to those things as they come along. We can't, um, we can't solve problems at the same level that they were, were created at. And what that means is that we have a structural foundation at 25th Street that's broken. And we keep layering things onto it, and it just can't hold. And what that means is that, um, for instance, we can't even get the bistro lights across the street because the stupid poles will not break, right? right? Um, it's been a lot of years ago. I know, and, and it's the dumbest thing ever. So change the stupid poles. Well, we can't do that because, and then just, you start to layer down into a whole bunch of structural problems. So we got to scrap all of that and, and change the foundation and what that to me looks like. And I learned this going into Denver. I, um, I know we're not Denver, but Denver has a lot of good examples, as does many other places. I just don't get out much because I hate flying. So I go to the places I can drive to. Um, that's right, you can't fly. Yeah. Uh, so we walk down um, uh, Larimer Square and I turn the corner and it's it's kind of 25th Street-esque, a little closer together, smaller streets, but very similar. And the whole place was curated as one experience. Different businesses, a lot of outdoor plazas, but it was during the holidays, so there were Christmas decorations that were consistent from business to business. The street poles had things on it. There was, it was a curated experience, and so some entity had to do that on behalf of the entire street. Um, so we've got to, in my opinion, get the city out of, out of the 25th Street business. We've got to um, fix 25th Street at a level, renew it to a level that's acceptable for everyone, and that means replace you know, the sidewalk enhancements, the streets, the light bulb, fix the infrastructure. And then once that's done, fund ODA to be the glue that holds everything together, to be the curator of 20th yeah. Street for yeah. businesses. And so you don't have to rely on the city to come and put lights on your, on your down trees. If a tree dies, you have the budget to fix it right. in the way that you want to. And you apply standards to that, that govern how you replace trees and how the lights get, you know, we got it. We got. We are the impediment to your success in a lot of ways, and so part of this plan is to figure out structurally what is broken, fix those things, and then allow you guys to um, operate under good principles. And I hope we can get there in the next uh, before Mayor Caldwell goes. That's we really got to make that permanent. Um, and, and so if he leaves and a new mayor comes in and wants to mess with stuff, then 
that we can't really go backwards. And kudos to you, Brian, for helping get the alignments off the ground, too. I mean, everybody's had to have a, some hard conversations and some faith in it, you know? So thank you for sitting with that and for being like a direct ear for him and for he, you know? And Tom, too. Like, that's huge, you know? Yeah, it's been fun, and, and you know, not everyone's a fan, yeah. but it doesn't matter to me because I believe we're doing the right things for the right reasons, and that's not. Um, so I know we have two other, I know this is like our first in-person meeting, so it's, I know it's a lot of information and there were definitely all the time, so I apologize, but, um, make option is on our site, if you can Google it too, um, Brandon, super appreciate you being here to present. Um, I also, we have a bunch of updates for Ella that are on our agenda, but I just want to make sure that you get a chance to interface with the 24th Street Guide at Projects, we understand. Um, how all those pieces are working as well. And then again, like if you have to leave early, um, we're recording this, so we can catch the video and fast forward into it as you, as you can catch up. Well, I guess I'm next. Um, it's fun to be part of this meeting. I live in Salt Lake. My son teaches high school up here, so we come up here regularly, love going out to dinner on the 25th Street area, so we, we, we love what you're doing. Um, I'm the engineer overseeing the reconstruction here on the 24th Street Viaduct Project. I've only got about three slides, it'll be quick. So the purpose of our project, we're repairing the potholes on the surface, we're replacing the joints on the bridge deck, we're going to be um, doing, going underneath, repairing some of the vents and the columns that are holding the structure up. And here at the east end of this structure, we are putting in um, ramps, taking out the stairs, putting in wheelchair accessible ramps to get you down off of the viaduct. Um, so the benefits of the project, we're gonna have better pedestrian access, better drainage, smoother roadway surface, um, and increased longevity on the, on the structure itself. The repairs we're doing are to get us another 20 years of life out of the project, out of the bridge. So what to expect, and I think you've all seen it out there, we've got traffic limited to eastbound only. Um, we are closed to westbound traffic. We are also closed to pedestrians and cyclists at this time. See, they made that clarification because I Shame on you, I hope you did it safely. From <laughs> I was supporting local. Yes. I think I'm the reason this happened again. Okay. <laughs> So there is some, to expect some dust, some noise, um, some lights out there. We do, we may be working nights up to seven nights during the project, um, but for the most part, we're working during the days. So our timeline, we began in the middle of April, going through lit, late May, we will be working on the south side of the structure. Well, once we get done with that, we'll flip traffic, put traffic on the part we just fixed, and we will fix the north side. Um, we have been working on the pedestrian ramp since we started. We're going to finish that in July. Um, we will have one full weekend closure. I believe it starts Friday night through Sunday night into Monday morning. That'll be happening the end of July um, as we get things finished up and we should be open to traffic in both directions by early August. Um, in conjunction, not associated with this project, but within our work zone. There is a paving project coming through on 24th Street from I-15 to Washington Boulevard. That will be starting in the middle of June, and it will be done beginning of August, the same time we open the viaduct. So... That's on 24th Street? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so here's a map. Um, showing our detours, the one-way traffic on 24th Street, and then the detours to get down to 31st Street, back on I-15, and to come back around on 24th Street. Um, for the locals, I have discovered some other little ways off of 21st Street, but and you probably all know about them too. Um, here's our contact information, phone number, um, email address, and website if you want to see that. We've got a sign-up sheet out on the table if you want to sign up for those email updates weekly. Um, you can sign up out there. 
Do you want to um, echo the last meeting we did was um, the junction meeting? We someone emailed me afterwards and asked about how people are are traversing. You guys are offering the transit. Can we talk about that? Yes. Um, if you do. For the pedestrians and the bicyclists um, needing to get across, we realize we don't have a spot for you to go safely. We are offering free bus passes to people who need to get across. Um, so if you, you go to our um, email address and request those, we can get those to you. Um, we've been handing those out to people who are walking across and biking across, trying to give them an alternative to stay safe. Yeah. And the corner. That's the corner from down here that is also <laughs> um, is one of the good locations for those too. Um, and so that's kind of a nice option for, and they actually can canvas out in the neighborhood over um, on the ABCE, those avenues all the way to the freeway. Um, and then this direction too, we've been working to make sure people have that. But there's a lot of people who are not necessarily going to answer their door for a random person. So um, just even though maybe that doesn't help you get in a bus pass, you have people in your life who are like, hey, what the heck? Um, just, you can always circle back through our office and we're happy to connect you here if you forget what this is or, you know, but that's just, if you hear that and kind of feedback throughout the process, um, I just thought that was kind of cool that you guys could get that You mentioned the pavement overlay as part of the, the bigger project. Yes. Uh, that obviously gives some pavement on the bike end as well. Are you, um, Painting the railings and replacing the fence and changing the lights at all. We are fixing the railing where it's broken. We're not, but just very limited areas. We are not painting that, um, and we are not doing anything with the lights. And the changing fence isn't getting replaced or just repaired. Um, we just repaired. They're across the viaduct. New changing fence going down the pedestrian ramps um, that are being built. That. To across it's all it's staying the same. That's too bad. <laughs> yeah, not my decision. Yeah. So I think I talked maybe I don't know if it was you I touched on the phone. But can you remind me what the parking situation is? Is first of all, are they gonna be putting that parking back underneath? Or are you guys gonna put that back? I mean I don't know if it was ever truly a parking lot, but a lot of people use it. And then is the one so like is the parking lot behind the Brigham New Brigham building, is that one closed? I'm, I'm in the good building and my parking lot is freaking full. So I'm just uh -huh. wondering what that, how that is all working currently and what the plan is. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't. There, the New Brigham um, parking lot is currently accessible. It was closed for like two days last week because okay. I had equipment over there. I assume it will be that same prop. Like we're on both on calls with them. <laughs> I assume that will be the case throughout this project as they move big equipment and not depending on where it's positioned, mm -hmm. whether or not you can turn um, left or right on the wall. Yeah. The parking is um, not at all available throughout the course of this prep like that parking area. Mm -hmm. um, it's not at all available throughout, but um, from the like vantage point of that, it looks like that space would still be there at the end of it because the stairway is actually um, like stock adjusted. Yeah. It's not a stairway, I'm sorry, it's a spiral instead of like a swirly. The ramp? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just wondering where all of the people are. It might have, yeah, it might have definitely been those days. And also, it just looks like it's closed. So it like, might just be people who well, are they're just not going, not out. wanting to navigate that. Yeah. Yeah, it's only been over the past week. Before that, it was totally, like, it was noticeable but manageable. But, like, the last two days, it's, like, crazy. So. We can ask, we have a, we can ask about that, too, if there's an opportunity for the next time, just for that building in particular to know that I'm out there. So if you want to give me your phone number, I can get the answer and call you back. Okay. You can call us, email us. I think um, I have your number written down. I think okay. It's not so. Okay. Sorry, I don't need the answer, but we can certainly <laughs> find out for you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to talk events real quick, short and sweet. Um, we've been working really hard with the health department and UDAF to make all of our events happen this year, starting the farmer's market. Wonderful. 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 
Okay. <laughs> oh, is it right there? Sorry. Um, so anyways, farmers market this weekend. We're super excited, starting early. Um, I know that it impacts your guys' businesses quite a bit. And so I hope the new time change from eight to one versus nine to two is going to be a benefit to you. Um, the thing that we do ask of you throughout all of our events the rest of the season is just to try to accommodate with your stores being open as much as possible during our events. We want um, the community to know what's there and to be able to experience not only the farmer's market, but also those, your guys' businesses. So, um, with so me- this Saturday, the 15th? Next no, week. sorry, next Saturday. Saturday. Okay. So, yeah, sorry, the 22nd. So it'll go the 22nd through um, September 11th. And then I have some merchant guidelines if you guys will pass those around. So those are uh, just the guidelines that we um, give out to all the businesses on 25th Street every year. Nothing has changed. Um, so you are allowed to have, um, you can be out in front of your storefront doing whatever you want to do. Um, of course, all the programming will be on the street. Uh, the only thing that we ask is that you have multiple um, artisans within your store that uh, that sell there, that only one comes out and vents per week. Um, but otherwise, nothing nothing else has changed from previous years. So we're opening it back up, we're back to three blocks. Yeah, yeah, we're all three blocks. Um, it was so crazy, just like last week, they just kind of loosened the reins. So it's gonna be pretty much Pretty much back to normal. Um, we are recommending masks, um, but not requiring them. Um, and then it, we are going to try to keep the six foot distancing from, you know, in between booth spaces and things like that. So we still are really keeping in mind the CDC guidelines and, and doing our best um, to follow them. How many vendors do we have? We have, um, we have quite, a, quite a few weekly vendors this year that will come just in and out throughout the market season. And then we have about 130 full season vendors. So at a full peak market day, it'll be right around 200 vendors, um, which is what we normally see. So it's so we're excited to see it all come back. Um, is there any questions about farmers market while we're on the topic? These rules that she just mentioned are not rules that we made up. They're actually like a legal requirement. Have a business shelf on the sidewalk and you have a business license and all of that. That's why these rules are we're just sharing them with you. That's why they even to be a vendor of farmers market or need to be part of your business. Um, that's a state and city requirement. So we're not just being jerks, we're trying to be so yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get a temporary business license um, and tax ID number to everybody that comes and vents at the market. So for those any change in logistics of flow? Of yes. Coming in and coming <laughs> yes, with all of the craziness that was just presented, um, with all of the um, construction going on. So 26th Street is completely out of question. Um, I'm planning for most of our market season. So a lot of like how things are going to come in, it's going to have to come off of wall and then kind of work its way through on the north side of the of 25th Street. So I'll be sending out procedures to all the vendors um, the top of next week, along with map, the map and everything. Um, but yeah, so otherwise, we're able to do three other events for the rest of this year. So um, next up, we have Music on the Plaza. That will be on Wednesday, starting June 9th to July 14th. And that takes place just next to, in between Wing Nuts and Sonora Grill. If you guys have never been to it, you should try and stop by it at one of those Wednesday nights. It is like the best atmosphere ever. It is a really fun event. And you're on NPR. Oh yeah? Yes. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Harvest, Moon, <laughs> Harvest Moon celebration. So it is happening. We are just um, not expecting to be able to host it at the scale that it normally is. Um, but we are still in the works on planning that. Um, and inviting vendors and um, getting that all situated. So we are planning to still incorporate the businesses to be out on the streets and support you guys as much as possible. 
um, but more details to come on that. Just mark your calendar for September 18th on that one. And then lastly, um, we move the car show that usually takes place in June to October 1st. So it'll still be a Friday night and we are planning to host that at full scale. So that, um, as you guys know, is one of the busiest nights uh, for 25th Street. So please just um, make sure you plan accordingly with that. Um, but yeah, that's what I have for you. We're excited to bring some stuff back and get things going again. But do you guys know fall market um, size and shape? Um, yes. So right now with fall market, we're planning to host it. So it'll be separate from summer market. We are going to have a whole new registration and everything just like we normally do. But instead of having it inside the amphitheater, we're going to pull it out onto the street. And we will be hosting the first day of fall market in conjunction with Harvest Moon. So, so great for us. That's good. <laughs> yes. So you're pretty talking about people that have food. All They're excited, food. right? All so that Harvest Moon will be two blocks. Yeah. And then the fall market right. will be the 300 block. The 300, 300 block. block. And awesome. that will occupy the 300 block until October 11th. And so you'll have activity on the street. It will impact you. It's October 23rd will be the last day of fall market. So it's a six week market starting Harvest New Day and going until October 23rd. So, but your growers are pretty stuck. They're, they've got food. Yeah, no, I'm going to in May. That's so exciting. Yes, yeah. And um, it just, it'll look, that fall market will look like, a lot like what the summer market looked like last year. So, yes. Any plans for winter market? We do not yet. We have um, some a couple of opportunities to kind of adjust our plan for a winter market this year, and so we are in the works of deciding what will benefit the community um, and our and our produce growers the most. Um, so yeah, that's still TV on that. Okay. Any other questions for me? That's it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, I will be brief, brief, because I know that we are over over on time, but thank you so much for staying. So just a few quick ODA updates. Um, our district meeting changes. As you can see, we are back in person, but in the month of May. And we were kind of thinking during COVID, since we were all doing Zoom meetings and sending out more email updates, if there was a way to kind of scale back the in-person meeting so that we're more mindful of your time as business owners, because we know an hour or an hour and a half out of your day is a lot, especially if you're the only one there. So right now we're thinking about meeting twice a year. So we won't be in person again until August. So this meeting served as kind of the setup for summer. So we could talk about farmer's market and events. And then the August meeting would then be our setup for fall, winter, and then we can meet again to talk harvest moon and that stuff. And then in between these two meetings, we'll still have monthly newsletters. If we have to have a special session, we can do that. If we need to call everyone to a Zoom meeting, we can do that. But this way we can have maybe hour, hour and a half longer meetings twice a year versus meeting as frequently as we used to. So that's something that you'll hear more about. And then you may have also noticed that our newsletter format changed. So at the top of every newsletter, there's a downtown dish video, which is basically my three minute or less overview of the newsletter. <laughs> so you can kind of listen to that while you're getting ready or maybe while you're doing office work at your business or things like that, just so that you know what to expect when you read below. And then we also readjusted our section. So we have our events programming, business support, arts programming, placemaking and destination development, community and economic development, and then our communication and marketing section. And these are directly reflective of our mission statement and our six pillars for ODA. And this is basically so that you all can see where the work that we are doing falls in answering to our mission statement. So hopefully that is clear to you so you can see exactly like what we're doing and what how we're moving through our year. So that was an exciting change. Our Instagram takeovers are still available. I know we didn't have a lot last year because there wasn't a ton going on and it was so up and down. But now with events and things coming back, if you would like to take over our Instagram, maybe on a market Saturday or first Friday art stroll, things like that, just send me an email and Thomas and I can get you the login for that. It's the same rules and guidelines and I can send you all of that if you're interested. But 
definitely take advantage of that. Our 25th Street platform is our largest by far on Instagram, so you definitely have quite a good reach there if you are interested. And then you've heard about the facade improvement grant several times today. It's also been in all of our newsletters, so there is some funding available, and I think we're looking at awarding the next in June. So if you're interested, please, please apply for that. Um, are there any other questions, opportunities? So no part show. Okay. No, okay. just October. And that's not ours, right? This is the people that are... Oh, yes. Yeah. So the one on the back, if you look on the back under the dates to say there's an August 14th oh, okay. car show, Sorry, and that one is exclusively in the Junction, and this is actually a group that Ogden City and Visit Ogden have worked to bring in, and so we're just making sure that information gets out to business owners. So, so we are doing our Yes. No. So there's one in August, one in October, not affiliated with each other. Good job, you guys. Oh. If there are, I know, we're excited though. And if there are any other questions, then thank you so much for coming. And make sure to grab Jessica's contact information, your liaison on your way out. Her license card is there. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. I know. Good to see you. Close.